All right. Uh, welcome back to the Naval News segment. Today we're going to be covering a story that was broken by uh, Dr. Rachel Pauling and published by uh, our good friends over at Covert Shores, H.I. Sutton, uh, together have come to bring us the story of Lockheed Skunk Works active sonar stealth submarine. It was a proposal uh, from 1980 uh, after the they saw the success of the stealth fighter and sold that to the United States military. They took the same concept and put it on a submarine and it worked. From the piece written by H.I. Sutton. You can read this yourself over at hisutton.com. Okay, let's restart here. It says, while developing the stealth submarine aircraft, which we know today is the F-117 Alpha Nighthawk, a.k.a. stealth fighter, Lockheed canceled or chanced upon something. It turned out that the faceted sides of the aircraft don't only deflect radar, they also deflect sonar. They found this out because they couldn't take a Polaroid picture of the airplane. So the way the Polaroid uh, cameras worked back in the day, I don't even know if they're around anymore, is they had this big silver sensor on the front that a lot of people thought was the camera, but it wasn't. Uh, that was actually uh, a sonar pinger, much like uh, what a bat would do whenever a bat flies around. And it would get the range of whatever subject was in front of it out to a few feet. It wasn't very long. Uh, and that's how the Polaroid camera knew knew where, where, where to focus its uh, lens at. So... But because the uh, the stealth fighter uh, was reflecting those sound waves away from the uh, transmitter, uh, a Polaroid camera could not take a clear photo of the stealth fighter. If you see the stealth fighter and you have a Polaroid camera at the museum in Ohio, try and take a Polaroid of it and you'll be astounded as to what you get. It's pretty cool. Um, but like I said, Polaroid camera has been gone for a long time. You may not have one that still works. Anyway. Uh, so I explained how that works. Let's move on to the piece here. It says, armed with this knowledge, Lockheed's famous skunk work set out to design a stealthy submarine using this principle. The idea uh, was to be invisible to active sonar used by enemy submarines, aircraft, and ships, uh, and incoming torpedoes. We think of Cold War sonar technology as primarily being passive sonar, listening silently to detect the targets before they detect you. This is broadly true, says the piece, but active sonar, where you transmit sound and listen for the rebounds, still played an important role, especially in the Soviet Navy, where their passive sonars were mostly less capable than the NATO side. Faceted sides didn't offer the advantage in passive sonar, but against active sonar, it could be a game changer. And uh, they have some simple drawings down here of how it, uh, oh, it's probably on, let's check this link here. Okay. That's, that's that's the ship version that they also built. Okay, so what they're saying is, is that as this active sound hits the si the slanted or canted sides of the submarine, uh, it does, it's not reflected back at the transmitter. It's reflected anywhere else other than that. And uh, so with these curved and slanted sides, uh, it would make it nearly invisible to active sonar. Okay, uh, this is relevant today from the piece. It says, because faceted sides are slowly becoming a thing on submarines. Several German, British, and possibly other country designs are taking advantage of this to varying extents. Uh, actually, Lockheed were not the first to hit on the idea of adding slope sides to a submarine to decrease active sonar cross-section. During World War II, Nazi Germany's Navy, the Kriegsmarine, designed the Type 29H U-boat with angled sides. But the Nazis didn't have the computers or the experimental knowledge that Lockheed had. So it's debatable as to whether or not the Type 29 would have actually worked. And there's a link here to the Type 29. This, this might have the drawing I'm thinking of. Um, so that's the concept drawing of what the Germans were thinking of building. It has a lot more angular sides and obviously no deck gun uh, compared to Oh, even has a little cutaway. Oh, here it is. Here's the drawing I was thinking of. So the idea, the theory is, is that no matter what direction the active sonar hits you from, it's going to be deflected at different angles. And so every time it's a sound is bounced or reflected, it loses a little bit of energy. And the softer that surface is, or the more absorbent it is, um, the more energy that sound will lose. So the idea is just to make it bounce around and maybe bounce back to the surface. Uh, so it loses energy before it goes back to the transmitter. It's a good theory and it works. 
And so uh, they they applied this theory to the uh, shadow was the shadow uh, sea shadow the stealth boat here. This I believe was out of San Diego, wasn't it? I forget what city this was in. It was on the west coast though. Okay, let's get back to the piece. Uh, instead of a stealth submarine was born directly from a stealth fighter project, the design was the brainchild of Ben Rich, uh, then director of Skunk Works. It leveraged extensively from the stealth fighter and actually looked a bit plane like. Uh, the cylinder pressure hull was encased with wide wing like outer hull, so it was a double hull submarine, which gave it a flattened diamond cross section. The edges of the faceted sides were softer than the aircraft, uh, more of an F 22 than an F 117, and the stern is broadened out into the two hulls and had twin screws. Inward canted upper angles uh, were up at the top, just like they had in the picture there. So it may have been. Well, he's speculating. I'm not going to read that. Here it is. A test showed that the faceted side reduced the submarine sonar signature by a thousand times. So it worked. Uh, enthusiastically, Ben Rich took this proposal to the Navy. However, it was not well received, partially because it compromised speed for stealth. Um, no order was made, so they, the Navy didn't buy any. Uh, and the project was not entirely wasted, however, because it led to the Sea Shadow stealth boat that you see here, too, with the canted sides. This is like, you know, this is Mark One Mod Zero of our first stealth ships. Uh, this thing was is extensively used for testing, really. Uh, and the, the ships that we build today are based on the knowledge we learned using the Sea Shadow. Anyway, really good story. I'm glad this finally came out. This is just one of those things that has, has been around. People knew about this, but it's been secret. So I'm glad they finally broke this. And so, you know, full credit to uh, Dr. Rachel and H.I. Sutton for doing this. What do you guys think of this design? Uh, oh, it's in San Francisco. Thank you. Yeah, the uh, Sea Shadow is. Uh, Vulcan Rider says, how does it affect hydrodynamics? It affects it a lot. It really slowed it down, which is why the Navy didn't buy it. Uh, the Navy, uh, especially at, in the Cold War, we wanted speed. And, you know, and then, you know, stealth came next. Uh, the only exception to that was the Ohio class, where stealth was everything. Right. But we wanted speed and because it sacrificed speed significantly. All these little doodads on here, um, they, they didn't buy it. The Type 29 looks like the Zumwalt. Yeah. Uh, see, the Ravenbridge says, oh, wow, the stealth submarine looks like a black manta from. The oh, yeah. Like from the old TV show. What was that voyage to the bottom of the sea? They had something like this. Yeah. Uh, the Sea Shadow is for radar stealth, not sonar stealth. Yes. Was I not clear on that? Of course, it's for radar. Okay, just in case I wasn't clear, that's for radar, yeah. Helipad, uh, how do you know uh, when things become declassified? Oh, um, you have to do a Freedom of Information Act request, and if you get it, it's declassified. That's literally how you find out, yeah. Kaided Haggis says, it's an awesome design, if looking a bit funky, but uh, how can the Navy afford it? Well, they didn't, and they couldn't, so they didn't buy it, yeah. The, the, the two screw designs was... Um, to help make up for the lack of speed, but this would have made it even noisier. So while this is an active sonar stealth submarine, it certainly would not have been a passively stealthy. It, it would have been a lot noisier. Yeah. Would the reflection depend on the sonar frequency? No, not as much. The frequency doesn't have any direct effect on the direction that it's reflected. Uh, it does um, have an impact on how much is reflected. So higher frequencies, uh, will reflect more than lower frequencies, for example. Just like a rule of thumb here. Hey, thank you for the gifted subs, Lady Rosie Lomax18. I appreciate that. If you got gifted a sub, make sure you say thank you to Rosie. Uh, grid and clicked, or grind and click, <laughs> says, uh, good call by the Navy. If the Russian sub can't find it in the first place, you don't need to have an active radar reflector. Yeah, so a lot of that was going through the Navy's mind, uh, whatever because this only worked for active sonar, not so not passive sonar. So, yeah, we were primarily a passive sonar focused Navy. Let's move on to the story that uh, our moderator, John, was talking about. This is the Yantar. Uh, the Yantar is the uh, spy ship research vessel, but it's actually a spy ship that's been loitering off the coast of Ireland for over a month now. And it's due to return to port September 27th. Uh, and it looks like it's beginning its transit back to uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, it's going through the English Channel, though, to get there. So that's raising a few eyebrows. Why is this spy vessel operating so close to France and, and the UK? 
And the answer is it's spying on you. So, but let's read from the piece here written again by H.I. Sutton. He's done the first two stories for us today. He says the controversial Russian research vessel Yantar has entered the English Channel heading northbound. It is currently south of the Lizard. The ship has turned on its AIS automatic information system, so it's currently visible on AIS aggregators such as marinetraffic.com. If we click this, I bet you'll we'll, we can get a real-time position. Yeah. This is where it is right now, like literally at the time of this recording. Huh. Let's uh okay, I'm going to click on the map. Will it show us? It will. Okay. So, right now it's moved a little bit. So, it's right off the coast of Calais. Isn't this Calais right here? What is this? Ugh. Anyway, um, let's move this out of the way if I can. So here he is, and he's transiting up this way. He's going to go into the Baltic Sea and, and get home. So this is a very good website if you're looking for ships. Even warships have these AIS transponders, so, so you can track them as well. Anyway, let's go back to the piece. Um, here's a picture of the Yantar here. Um, Yantar is known for operating near undersea infrastructure, including internet cables. It was recently seen near uh, internet cables off the coast of Ireland. Yeah, it was uh, a connect one is the name of that cable. It was laid down in 2015 It went operational in 2016. And so it's been operating for about five years and it connects New York city to Dublin, Ireland and London, uh, England. So, the big thing that goes through that cable is financial information because those are two huge exchanges uh, in London and in New York City. But any other, you know, internet traffic can be on that cable as well. But it's highly likely that they were trying to tap, record, you know, collect information uh, be between the financial exchanges. That's what we think that they were doing. Oh, and that's the end of the piece. So take a look at this picture. Here's a picture of uh, the Yantar. It's got two submarines on it. Well, four really, but two of those are manned. Deep diving, autonomously, you know, independent with the crew on board. Uh, it's a three-man crew, and they can go down and manipulate things on the bottom like internet cables. <clears throat> they can tap the cables with vampire taps, uh, passive taps. Uh, that's really the primary mission of this of this boat, but it could also recover things like they did do a goodwill mission in 2020 off the coast of Brazil to find or investigate the sunk Argentina submarine, the ARA San Juan uh, that sank in heavy weather um, a few months ago or a few months before they did that. Um, and I don't know what they found, but they did offer to go down there and provide some forensic investigation for the for the Argentine now, the two other ones that they have uh, that are not manned are tethered deep submergence submersibles that are controlled from topside here in this control center. Uh, and they can go down and they can record. They've got cameras on them. One of them even has a little grappling arm so it can grab onto something and they can tether it back up to the ship. Whereas the independent submersibles here, um, they have more tools and can collect a few more things uh, before coming back up to the surface. Anyway, this is the Antar. They're building another one of these. They've built two so far, one for the Atlantic, one for the Pacific. Yantar is the Atlantic one. There's a third one that they just laid uh, the keel for. So they're going to have another one of these going around. This underwater recovery and investigation is very popular in Russia. They love doing this type of espionage. And... For those of you that may be wondering, these are not submarine rescue vessels. They don't have the dock on these man subs or the unmanned subs uh, to rescue crewmen from submarines. So, and from a Russian perspective, that makes sense because all Russian submarines now have the escape pod for the entire crew. So ideally, the crew would escape themselves. They wouldn't need rescuing from a submerged position as long as everything goes well, uh, which it didn't do with like the curse. They couldn't get to the, to, to, to the pod. Anyway, so that's, these are not for rescuing anything. These are for, you know, investigating, collecting forensic evidence. Oh, they could also be doing archaeological stuff too. They could go to like the Titanic or into the Med where there's, you know, thousands of shipwrecks in the Mediterranean. They could go to any one of them and uh, collect stuff for museums and whatnot. So those would be some re scientific, you know, missions for this, which it pretends to do. Uh, but it, the same capability can be used for espionage, which is what it actually does. And uh, the uh, Irish Navy or Ireland's yeah, Navy was out keeping an eye on, on this. And uh, 
uh, the UK had sent maritime aircraft to keep an eye on it as well from, from the air because they had turned off their AIS for about three weeks while they were off the coast of Ireland. So no one knew exactly where they were without going out and putting eyeballs on them. All right. So what do you guys think about this? Uh, let's see. Dilly says, yes, comrade. Why would you need to rescue a submarine when you can deny it sinking? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Diggers58 says, I hope you check out the cables for bugs. Well, there's lots of things we can do because now that we know that they've done that, um, and one, it's a, it's a civilian cable. So the company could actually you know, go after Russia for tampering with their stuff. Uh, they haven't done that, but that's one thing. But we could also put false information on that cable. So there, there's more than one way to approach this type of espionage. This, this type of espionage is very ineffective because they do it out in the open. Now, one way, one, one type that is very effective is whenever they bring the Belgorod out with uh, their mini sub and they do the same operation submerged. Yeah, that requires an extra level of surveillance because we, we have to follow them out of port, you know, with, with, with our submarines or NATO submarines, not necessarily ours. But as long as they do it with this vessel here, we just watch the vessel be like, oh, he's off the coast of Ireland. All you got to do is bring up a chart, see where the undersea cables are. And you're like, okay, he's, he's tapping. In this case, it was AE, A Connect 1 was the name of the undersea cable. Yeah. Uh, Jesse's Gaming says, we certainly can't complain about them doing this. We started it with the halibut. Yeah, yeah. But the difference is we can do it. They're not allowed to because we're America. Okay, that's how that works. <laughs> the Jimmy Carter. Yeah, yeah. You calm down there with the Jimmy Carter. We don't like to talk about that. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next piece.